I am uh, Brigadier Dr. Mishra. I am heading the eye department of Army Hospital R&R and I am a veteran surgeon. So this topic is uh, extremely important students. Uh, this is for you because I have been going to various centers. I am a regular examiner and a paper setter. So this is indefinitely an examination. You will get, you will get a case either in theory or in viva, long questions, short question, but this is the backbone of your examination. So you have to know adaptic retinopathy inside out. So basic, the objective of this lecture is to tell you about the disease burden of adaptic retinopathy, the pathogenesis, the clinical spectrum, management, role of ophthalmologist in early diagnosis, role of ophthalmologist in reducing the risk of developing adaptic retinopathy, and the treatment of adaptic retinopathy. So when do you expect a diabetic retinopathy is commonly asked question, what is the diabetic age of a patient? So this is what is the diabetic age of patient, that when do you expect the diabetic retinopathy? So in type 1 is 13% of patients have retinopathy at 5 years, 90% at 10 to 12 years of uh, diabetic uh, detection of diabetes and eventually 25% of these cases after 15 years develop into a PDR. Whereas in type 2, 40% prevalence after 5 years. After 15 to 90, uh, 19 years, it uh, goes up to 84%. And as far as PDR is concerned, to, they have a lesser risk. So it's all, always asked a question. So retinopathy, the PDR is incidence is higher in a case of a type 1 diabetes. So up to 25% cases at the end of 25 years. So worldwide prevalence, we know that India has become a diabetic capital of the world. We have around 77 million people with diabetes as on 2019. And we have a prevalence of diabetic retinopathy from 10.25% to 26.15%. We have various studies in India which has taken down this percentage. So what is, how does a diabetic retinopathy pathogenesis, you should know that basic crux in this case is hyperglycemia and oxidative stress. These two are interlinked. So various pathways come into play, which, which is like polyol pathways, hexamine pathways, AG acclimation, and PKC pathways. They are all interlinked. They will have oxidative stress, which will lead to inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response will cause neovascularization. Lead to increase in the VEGF. Ultimately, it's all connected. VEGF is being increased because of these pathways. And again, VEGF is also adding on to the formation of new vascularization. Ultimately, all these cumulative effect leads to formation of retinopathy. So let us see how does adaptic retinopathy uh, uh, goes and starts in a capillary. This is normal capillary. You can see the endo. It is uh, uh, the you start from inside. It's got endothelial cells which are tightly adherent to each other forming the blood retinal barrier. They are surrounded by the basal membrane and outside by pericytes. This is a healthy normal capillary. This we all know the blood supply of retina which starts from the inside goes to the outer side of retina. The blood flow in normal capillary we all know that the, uh, in normal person the RBCs are uh, uh, very pliant RBCs, they don't get stuck to each other. The platelets are healthy and there's a blood retinal barrier. So it's all the flow is very smooth. What happens is when there is an alteration in the capillary of diabetic retinopathy. You see that the, that the, the blood, the endothelial cells, the tight junction starts breaking up. It becomes start loosening. The pericytes, there is a uh, the thickening of the basal membrane starts happening and the, the nucleus of the peri, uh, pericytes starts getting altered. Then as the damage further progresses, it's the, uh, the capillary starts getting thinned out. When it starts getting thinned out, if you see this, it starts bulging. It starts bulging, the capillary wall starts bulging and hence the formation of the microaneurysms and the ear mass. This alteration in the tight junctions which leads to the breakage of the, the blood retinal barrier and the outpouching of the capillary walls. It starts, it starts getting thinned out, it starts getting outpouched. This outpouching 
uh, and because of this uh, defect in the RBCs, they become more rigid. The moment they become more rigid, they starts getting st stuck to each other. The platelet starts getting stuck to each other, and this out pouchings will have the RBCs, which will get stuck inside this, and you will see the thrombosis which is happening. If you see this uh, microaneurysms, it goes into various stages. The stage one is the background microaneurysms, which is barely visible, even on angiography. Then comes the stage two, which is slightly more advanced. You can see a dot, like uh, fluorescence, a dot in, in angiography. When it becomes more advanced, it becomes leakage. It starts leaking. So these are the leaking microaneurysms. And when the leakage starts, the edema starts happening. And over after, after uh, the last stage is the thrombosis of this microaneurysm becomes thrombosed and seals off. This is how I told you that uh, how the formation of uh, clotting, which happens because of the more rigid, uh, non-deformable erythrocytes, which get stuck together, and also because of the platelets, which uh, are drawn there and they become stuck to each other. The shunts, what happens? Uh, normally, the shunts are there in the retina, but uh, it doesn't open up. How does, it's a nature's way of, you know, increasing the blood supply to the ischemic retina that these nat natural shunts which are available between the arterioles and the venules start opening up. And you see this, these are the irmas. The common question is, you know, how do you differentiate between irma and a new escalation? So what are the features? Can anybody tell? Because this will be asked when you case, get a case of a diabetic retinopathy will ask, how do you, because they look similar. If you see clinically, they will look like a new vascularization. So the IRMA is what? There's larger volume, larger lumen vessels. They are straighter. Whereas in new vascularization, and IRMAs are slightly deeper. Whereas, whereas uh, the new vascularization, it's more superficial. The vessels are, you know, coiled and much finer vessels. And of course, once you do an angiography, the neuroscular vessel will, will, there will be leakage there, whereas IRMAs don't leak. So this is how it happens at the diabetes. There's a chronic hyperglycemia, which leads to a metabolic response. There's a chronic inflammation, which, and also there's a microvascular damage, which includes the endothelial damage capillary occlusion and leukostasis, which all leads to ischemia. All these are collectively leading to ischemia. Ischemia is leading to increased VEGF. And again, this VEGF is leading to neuroscalation and also the breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. So ultimately, all leads to neuroscalation and edema. So what are the risk factors of diabetic retinopathy? One is a non-modifiable, which includes age, race, sex, type, puberty, and pregnancy. And modifiable is the diabetic control, hypertensive control, anemia, nephropathy management, weight reduction, and exercise. So what is the common symptom? How does the patient come to you? They usually come to you with diminution of the central vision, and which happens because of the diabetic macular edema, or could be because of the ischemia. And they can also come with a field defect. Field defects come in an advanced stage when you have a traction lateral detachment or a vitreous image. So we all know that the diabetic retinopathy can be divided into three stages, non-proliferative, proliferative, and advanced eye disease. So this is the non-proliferative, which is further divided into mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. So mild, you can see the microaneurysms with hard exudate. This is when you do an angiography, you can see microaneurysms as hyperfluorescent dots. The moderate one will have more extensive microaneurysms and you will have hemorrhages with cotton wool spots and venous beadings. So if you see this, this kind of a, a picture in a hard exudate, in a ring form which is known as a circinate retropathy, you will invariably find a leaking microaneurysm which is cause of this. 
So the central part will have a leaking mycorrhizal, which will have a bearing on your treatment protocol. That means if you just do a focal laser in the leaking mycorrhizals, this kind of sensory retinopathies resolve. And, and moderate is, we all know that, uh, so uh, extensive microenzymes, hemorrhages, I have told you about this, location of diaptic retinopathy. Uh, hemorrhages in diaptic retinopathy, it could be a vitreous hemorrhage. If you start from anterior to posterior, it could be vitreous hemorrhage. It could be pre-retinal hemorrhage. It could be uh, superficial hemorrhages. It could be deep hemorrhages. So these superficial hemorrhages, they happen in the superfi superficial capillary network and deep in the deep capillary network. They are flame-shaped, superficial is flame-shaped. It's commonly asked why they are flame-shaped because it takes the shape of the nerve fiber layer and the deep are in the nuclear layers. The uh, uh, development of cotton wool spots, we all know that it's because of the ischemia in the superficial and deeper capillary network. The venous dilatation, you can see the beading in the venus. So this is also part of the uh, vascular changes in the retinopathy. So this is more of a pictorial to make you understand that how it looks like. So the uh, severe form will have you. We all know that ET Darius uh, study said that four to one rule of four to one. So you have more more than twenty intraretinal quadrants uh, hemorrhages in all four quadrants. Definitive venous beading in two or more quadrants and prominent ermas in one or more quadrants. So we all know that retinal edema. Uh, is very important part of uh, the diaptic retinopathy. Uh, these, all these uh, microaneurysms and irmas, they start leak, leaking and they thicken the retina, causing the edema part. Then comes the proliferative diaptic retinopathy. So we have any retinal neovascularization, whether it is an NV or NVD, will label into the, as a proliferative uh, diaptic retinopathy. This is how the new vessel starts forming. And in advanced eye disease, uh, there is a tractional retinal detachment or NVG. So NVG and tractional retinal detachment makes into an advanced eye disease. NVG starts from the pupillary margin and goes into the uh, angle. There's, there's a contraction of the angle and causes a closed angle glaucoma. So this is the uh, progression of a uh, diaptic retinopathy. Uh, background diaptic retinopathy will have microaneurysms, microhemorrhages, small area of ischemia. When the the predominant the, uh, ischemic element is there, then it goes into from pre-proliferative to proliferative stages. And when there is a predominant edematous component, it goes into a non-proliferative diaptic retinopathy, which could be a cystoid macular edema or a fibrous macular traction with severe vision loss. So how the adaptic macular edema progresses, if you see that uh, there are s st swelling which starts from, uh, if you see the top, there is no macular edema. But incipient cystoid edema, you'll have two levels of uh, edema cells, one the inner and the outer layer, and they start coalescing, they start collecting, they start getting mixed, and they form a large cyst. And or once the disease is remaining there for a long time, they collapse and cause a fibrosis. So the classification which I have told you is that apparently no diaptic retinopathy, mild, moderate, severe and PDR changes. The classification of DME, it's a very important short question you get that classification of how do you classify DME. So it could be apparent, uh, that is no apparent DME, mild DME, moderate and severe DME. Mild will have some retinal thickening which is not involving, which is away from the center of the fovea, uh, center of the macula. Uh, moderate is retinal thickening or a hard exudates near the center, but not involved, near the center, but not involving the center, and severe is the involving the center. So, how do you manage? You have a, a strict glycemic control, optimization of BP, hemoglobin, lipid profile, reduction of obesity, aerobic exercise, and management of nephropathy. So uh, basically, regular screening is very, very important in these cases. When do you do not have any diaptic retinopathy, you do it yearly, and once it starts developing, then the reduction, the, the duration of review reduces. 
So as far as uh, uh, glycemic control is concerned, we should have a good uh, glycemic. It sh one should not aim for a very strict glycemic control because they can, a patient can go into hypoglycemia. So a good glycemic control, which says around seven or less. Also, uh, we have seen that uh, rate of progression decreases as the HbA1c is well controlled. Also, as for the blood pressure is console, uh, concerned, the various trials like a court study has shown that uh, one should do an adequate BP control, not a very strict, because once you go for a strict control, the risk for other comorbidities increase. Also, the court study studied about the, this important study uh, from uh, the eye point of view and from the general medicine point of view. It also studied about the role of uh, lipid lowering agents, phenofibrate, in reduction of the diabetic retinopathy. So, uh, diabetic macroedema, the treatment path remains that the mainstay of treatment in, in diabetic retinopathy in edema is anti VEGFs. We all know anti VEGFs, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflibercept, brolizumab. Brolizumab is a very important, this recently got a FDA approval in treatment of diabetic retinopathy and farizumab. Then intravital steroids uh, form a very, very uh, important part of uh, treatment in diabetic retinopathy. We have an international paper in that when we compared the role of uh, dexamethasone implant versus uh, triamcinolide in treatment of diabetic uh, retinopathy. So one milligram of triamcinolone, preservative-free, very important, you should say that word, preservative-free triamcinolone in treatment of, is equally effective in treatment of diabetic macular edema, where the patient is poor and cannot avert fancy treatment. Uh, laser, uh, one cannot understate the importance of laser in cases of uh, diabetic, which could be a grid laser or which could be a focal laser, which I told you, and a modified grid laser. So, uh, this is uh, once the patient, you remember that if the patient is not responding to multiple injection of one anti-VEGF, please switch over the anti-VEGF. Here's a case which he received multiple injections of uh, bevacizumab and ranibizumab, didn't respond, we switched him to idea and after two injection patient had final, the, the, uh, the edema resolved. So, uh, uh, as far as PDR is concerned, how do you treat a PDR? PDR is definitely uh, uh, the main uh, st uh, stay of treatment in the case of PDR is anti vegf and laser. One has to, uh, one very commonly asked question that, you know, in the case of a diabetic retinopathy, if you see a small NV which is uh, in a two, two o'clock quadrant, what, what do you uh, do? So, invariably the student says, we'll do a sector laser. No. In diabetic retinopathy, there is no role of any sector laser. So it is a PRP. In a case of a PDR, it has to be a PRP, nothing less than PRP. So uh, when, what happens when there is a vitreous hemorrhage? Uh, if it is a mild, one can wait for three months. Uh, give laser, if you can see the retina, augment with anti-VEGF. And if it is dense, if it is not resolving in less than three months, one should do operate. This is how one, uh, this is a vitreous hemorrhage, which is you have to do a, a gentle vitrectomy. And this is a case where there was a PDR with a tractional detachment. One has to do a complete vitrectomy. Uh, while doing vitrectomy, one has to be very, very gentle. You cannot do a PVD because this PVD, if you, they are firmly adherent and they tend to bleed a lot. So all these cases, it is commonly asked, what do you do? So you give a preoperative anti-VEGF if the macula is not involved. If the attraction retinal detachment, also you can give anti uh, and but you have to operate all these cases within four days because after four days the fibrovascular response is there so that they can tear off the retina and increase the TRD. So uh, that's all. Any questions from my uh, from your side? Uh, I'll be happy to. So, but uh, believe me that this is a very very important topic from theory from practical point of view and once you pass out you will get cases so you are responsible for all these cases so you should know everything inside out